Welcome to a deeper listen from KEXP. Every Tuesday, we'll bring you long form conversations with artists about the ideas and experiences that shape their music. I'm Emily Fox. If you've been following Sound and Vision for a while and have enjoyed these types of artist interviews on this feed, then a deeper listen is for you. The first conversation I want to share is with Alinda Segura of Hooray for the Riff Raff. A lot on this record is about how grief is not a punishment, it's an act of love, and it's just another expression of love. Shortly after Hooray for the Riff Raff's latest album was written, Segura's father passed away. But this album covers more than grief. Among other things, it's a time capsule of Segura's time hitchhiking and train hopping around the country. That happened after Segura left New York where they grew up and before they put down roots in New Orleans. The album's melodies are catchy and the lyrics are so beautifully crafted. They drew me in and made time stop for a moment. Here's my conversation with Alinda Segura of Hooray for the Riff Raff about their album, The Past is Still Alive. You know, you know that time can take you for a ride, can take you by surprise. Maybe you will snake eyes. Baby, tell me why you gotta play your luck. Two aces call your bluff. I love you very much and all that other stuff. Your melodies and lyrics hit me like a freight train the first time I listened to this album and had me in tears a few times. And one of those lyrics was on the first track of this record. Um, it's called Alibi. And, you know, th- there's this melody that sucked me in and there was a few parts, you know, you have like some lyrics about, you know, like ruling the dice. But then I heard you sing the lines, thawing out my heart like meat. And that that line was like, wow, what a clever line. And then you follow that line up with, I see your track marks poking through your hoodie sleeve. And then I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't know you were going to go there. Thawing out my heart like meat, I see your track marks poking through your hoodie sleeve. Tic-tac-toe game to the destiny, I grieve. This track is about heroin, and you say it was a part of your childhood, and you you were always the one supporting someone with addiction. And that role that you ended up playing was kind of addictive for you, you know, to, to be the person to take care of someone else going through addiction. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, I think growing up in New York City and being a part of the punk scene and just being in a community of really brilliant and very frustrated kids, it it kind of leads to feelings of exploration and and also of of addiction. I think like I've just seen so many beautiful people and brilliant people who feel extremely frustrated with the ways of the world um, have this outlet that has been really difficult to navigate as somebody who loves people who are struggling with addiction. And growing up, I really didn't know, you know, I think I w- what I was feeling now that I'm older, uh, what I was feeling was a lack of resources and a lack of harm reduction, a lack of conversation about it in a humane way by people in power. So I think that's like the confusion that I had as a kid was these people are so important and we need to find a way to get them support and to also keep them alive. And um, I think that's the confusion I was feeling was there should be resources and there should be, we should be talking about this because it touches people from all walks of life. And um, I think now that I'm older, I can finally see that clearly. Mm-hmm. I mean, you mentioned Narcan in your song Snake Plant. Most of our friends are dead, so tested drugs, remember Narcan. There's a war on the people, what don't you understand? There's fentanyl and everything, don't become an angel with a broken wing. And I understand that, that you'll have free Narcan at all of your shows on your on your upcoming tour. Can you elaborate more on that decision? Yeah, I think I had a moment of clarity when lockdown happened and I was learning more about what um, people struggling with addiction were going through in that moment. I also know that in New Orleans and, and nationwide, there is a very serious issue of fentanyl overdose. And I just feel like 
it's really important that we use these tools that we already have. You know, the stigma is what's stopping us from making sure everybody has this life-saving medicine that reverses overdose. I think like we could be saving so many lives. So I wanted to write about it in my song because I just hadn't heard a song mm-hmm. name check Narcan yet, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. and and that's a big part of why I started writing songs. I, I grew up like really loving punk and then also getting really obsessed with American folk music. So it's this like, combination of using song as a way to spread information and using song as a way to talk about what's happening around you and being a witness and being like this isn't being spoken about enough so I'm gonna like nudge it up to the top of public conversation yeah and it feels really good to put it into practice because of this organization this must be the place we're able to bring free Narcan to all of our shows in in um the U.S. and it's been really good to put the lyrics into the work. Wow, that's great. Um, You know, you you spent a few years hitchhiking and train hopping around the U.S., and memories from those days show up on this record, including the song Snake Plant. In the bushes while I wait for a train Under the bridge when it starts to rain I never got to ride the sunset road But I drank enough a hundred pools and you've got a line in Snake Plant that, that has me wondering, where were your favorite places you traveled to during during those days? And where do you wish you would have made it to? Uh, well, in that lyric, I say I never got to ride the Sunset Route. And that's like a, a route of the lower half of the country, like going through the desert. And I really wish I would have done that. But honestly, my favorite places were places that were out in the middle of nowhere that were like way across Georgia and like, you know, these tiny towns that I just knew I would have never experienced or seen for myself unless I was going through this like back alleyway through the country. And also a lot of my favorite experiences were being a part of radical community at that time and just experiencing like protests, anti-war protests, and also seeing kids come together and reclaim abandoned buildings and make sure that each other were fed and do programs like Food Not Bombs, like making sure people could eat free food at multiple days a week if they just show up at a park. Those were my moments that have lasted the most with me. What was like a week like? Like, how would you describe a week when you were train hopping, hitchhiking? Like, yeah, how would you describe that to me? Well, there's two different versions of it for me. One was before I played music and one was after I played music. And before I was able to get like access to playing music with other people, it was really, you know, quite scary. I was constantly thinking of, well, where can I get free food? And there's a feeding here. So I guess I'll go there. And also a lot of of interactions with police that were really negative and just kind of being like kicked out of everywhere you go <laughs> like, yeah. being like, okay, I guess I got to leave now and I got to leave this place now. And, and then after going to new Orleans and meeting other young kids who encouraged me to start playing music with them, that was when my days were just filled with being obsessed with, Oh my God, there's this fiddle tune that is so good that somebody showed me a recording of and, here's a Woody Guthrie song and I want to learn all the words by heart that that was like the change in that lifestyle for me was suddenly I had a purpose and an outlet and and a craft that I could really dive into. Mm -hmm. In Snake Plant you sing I'm so happy that we escaped from where we came. I'm curious, what were you escaping from? And what was that reference in that line? For me, it was an escape of of feeling very misunderstood, of feeling like I knew that there was a purpose for me that was undetermined. And I also knew that the path that was laid out for me by society was not going to, it was a path that I would not excel at. You know, I was terrible in school and it wasn't because I didn't love to learn. I just like was going through a lot of difficulties at that stage in my life. And I felt not 
seen or or understood. And I really I also felt immense frustration with the way our country was heading. And, you know, I was a freshman when 9-11 happened and also spent a lot of my youth going to anti-war protests and feeling just like so much anger as I learned more and more about the ways of the world. So escaping meant finding hope. I was trying to find a, a way of life that led to some kind of freedom, whatever I could get my whole, like my hands on and, and also community and, and finding people who would see me as myself that I didn't have to conform to what I was supposed to be. They could see that there was like beauty and, and value and who I was and would also be open to me consistently changing and growing. And I think that's what I found when I found the queer punk scene were people who were excited by change and were excited by somebody constantly growing and exploring who they are or what their soul is calling them to be. Hiding from the cops in Oklahoma, Nebraska Getting dropped off on a county line Ogallala is a song on this album that was inspired by a town that you went to during your nomadic days. Talk about the events that led you to this town. Yeah, I was hitchhiking. We had been unsuccessful in riding trains out east, and I was hitchhiking, and that was also going very badly. <laughs> um, so we were getting kicked out of of a major highway, and the cops would send us to a smaller one and dump us off there. And, you know, it was like this almost comical bad luck situation that, of course, like now I look back and I'm like, wow, I'm so I, even though I was a homeless kid, I'm so privileged that like the cops, they were at just bringing us somewhere and dropping us off as opposed to like immediately arresting us. And um, so I was on tour recently and and drove through this town with my band and just had this really surreal moment of all of the lives that I've led just kind of intersecting for a moment and creating this vortex of, wow, I'm back. I never thought I'd be back in this tiny town. And it led to this song and this, this like realization that comes at the end of it of, I used to think I was born in the wrong generation. And now I know I made it right on time. This feeling of, I know that this is the time for me to be doing my work as an artist and to be witnessing what I am and to try and be a part of a present day movement of creating a future for all of us on this planet. I used to think I was born into the wrong generation, but now grew up in New York, you know, traveled for a few years. You now live in New Orleans where you've lived for a time. Is there a certain era or time frame or place that you think has made the biggest imprint on you musically? Definitely these er the early days of being in New Orleans. New Orleans is a really important place in America. The musical history is so strong and it's just a place where music is a community act and it's a part of the grieving process and it's part of the celebration process. And it's also like a very big live music place that really encourages expanding on tradition and honoring elders. So I think it was really important for me to go there at a young age and be humbled and to um, really try to take in those foundational viewpoints and philosophies, you could say, about what music is meant to do. Um, even though this is a band, you know, it's it's my band and I write about myself, I also do feel like New Orleans has imprinted on me this desire to be a witness, to have my music be some, to be useful to the community, you know. So going back through some of these stories in this in this record, tell me about the person who inspired the song Hawk Moon. And you never know the way I miss, miss 
Yeah, I've been so happy to um, be able to talk about my old friend, Miss Jonathan, who I haven't seen in many decades. Um, I met her when I was 17 and I was newly in New Orleans and still didn't know how to play music. And meeting her, she was the first trans woman I ever met. I just found this like kinship and friendship that made me feel so safe and was really like a joyful, like childlike moment after a very difficult go of of leaving home and trying to figure it out. Um, meeting her felt like I was able to just like have fun and play. And, you know, we weren't around each other for that long, that type of life, like people come in and out of your life, sometimes very quickly. But I think this record also talks a lot about like, kind of the, the idea of queering time where that moments spent with people, even if they're short, are just as valuable as very long periods of time that you spend with someone. I think we have this like hierarchy of relationship and what's important in time and length of time and what's important. And I spent probably only a few months hanging out with her, but the impact has lasted for decades. Yeah, I think about your line, she opened up my mind in the holes of her fishnet tights, which I, I just, I love. She opened up my mind in the holes of her fishnet tights. And I'm curious, like, what did she teach you about gender? Well, at the time, I knew that I was just, like, really drawn to her, and I thought she was so beautiful, and I thought she was, like, just electrifying to be around and... You know, throughout the years, um, especially for me, it was after lockdown, I just understood more about how I am non-binary and just kind of allowing myself that freedom. I think for a long time, I felt like, oh, I don't want this to be a huge deal or I don't want to take up a lot of space and put a, a name on this. Or for some reason, I felt like it would be a, a burden on other people to talk about that. And thinking back on Miss Jonathan, I know that she led the road, she opened up the road for me of, of freedom that I could give myself, you know, and just to give myself that, that ability to explore and the openness of possibility. Your song, Colossus of Roads, um, was written after the Club Q shooting in Colorado, um, a gay nightclub where five people were killed and 25 were injured. Hold my head like a live wire, duck quick now I hear gunfire, caught somewhere in the space between, do you love me, do you love me? And you say this is your favorite song to date and that it's a sacred song to you. Why do you think that is? Well... A lot on this record is about how grief is not a punishment, it's an act of love, and it's just another expression of love. And that song was a very interesting experience of just channeling, you know, like there are some songs that come to me very fast, and there are others that take years and a lot of editing and a lot of like craft work. And then there are some that come to you that the work is actually just unblocking yourself and allowing all that you've already taken in to come out. So the experience of writing Colossus of Rhodes was really important to me because I felt like it was a moment where I finally got a grasp on what my language is. And it's a moment that I wanted to create of, you know, just about three minutes of feeling safe where someone, the listener could turn it on and it could be us under a pillow fort where I'm showing different images or examples of what I find beautiful. It's kind of, it's a collection of Eileen Miles's work or the artwork of Buzz Blur or painting graffiti on the oil cans in Philly or, you know, just trying to collect these moments and saying, even though we live in this very scary, violent world where we can feel so under threat, here is a moment where you are safe and you can just turn this on and and look and take in beauty. I know that it's dangerous, but I want to see you undress. Wrap you up in the bomb shelter of my feather bed. Eileen, I must be living twice. 
twice Colossus of Rhodes buzz blur in the night Cowboy hat and a cigarette Grease marker and my leather vest Let's go paint the oil cans Write our names on a grain of sand No one will remember us Like I will remember us You know, you're talking about, you know, grief did you say grief is an act of love? Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think about that and I think about, you know, your father passed away after you wrote this album and he shows yeah. up in some of these songs. Snake plants, Florida water. I only want it ever be a good daughter. Soft hands, gold rings. Try to remember most everything. You know, I understand that you were raised in part by your aunt and uncle. Mm-hmm. How would you describe your relationship with your father and if your view on that relationship has changed since writing this album and his passing? Well, my relationship with him, you know, I grew up with my aunt, who's his sister, my aunt and uncle, and I would visit him a lot. And and I was always aware that my dad was struggling with PTSD and effects of him being in the Vietnam War when he was very young. But he was a musician and he was an artist and he was a music teacher. And even though we had issues, you know, where I was like a troubled teen, basically, and like, I still had this understanding that only grows and grows of of what he went through and what he experienced being a Puerto Rican kid who was thrown into this war. And it was through art that he spent decades healing or trying to heal himself. And what I saw throughout his life was a never ending pursuit of finding peace. And he found that peace through his art and through collecting art and playing music every day and enjoying poetry and enjoying enjoying beading, you know, he would make jewelry. So that's um, what I take away was that The art was the guide. So when I lost him, I lost him very suddenly a month before recording this record. I was able to to know that I could rely on my art being the guide and kind of doing this trust fall into the work and saying, I have no control over this, but I'm going to follow the songs and the songs will lead me to where I'm supposed to be. Mm, yeah. Is is he the voice that we hear at the very end of this record? Yeah, I wanted him to get the last word. Mm. He he really, lo- you know, he was kind of like the fifth member of the band. I had him on. <laughs> I put him on one of our album covers. He was in like a couple of different music videos. And uh, he really loved being a part of it in that way. I know he's really proud. So I thought it was it was important to give him the last word. All right, and there is your puppy. I want to congratulate you. I saw, <laughs> I saw you yesterday. It was wonderful. You had, you had happy eyes, which was good. Love you. Bye-bye. I think it's important that this record is a container for people who are experiencing grief. I just think we don't talk enough about grief as a part of life and I'm hoping that this record can be a container for people who are experiencing it in all forms, in just forms of change of life or losing a relationship or, you know, growing older and not recognizing who you're becoming. I really hope that this record can be a a container or just like a, a place that people turn to when they're feeling that type of confusion or feeling that type of fear. Um, because as I said, I do th- believe that if we could change the narrative about grief and and not see it as a punishment, see it as a journey that we transform through and that the, the guiding light through it is love. It's not actually the suffering, which is a part of it. It's the love that is the guide. When you think about, you know, grief and love and how that comes to this album, is that mostly as you think about your father? Is there any other things that came to mind as it relates to grief in this record? I think I'm grieving also like the beginning chapter of my life. You know, Mm. I think I'm going into a a different chapter. And they say that that happens when you lose a parent also. Mm. It really feels like my childhood is over. (laughs) You know, I mean, and uh, even though, I have a friend who says it's never too late to have a happy childhood, Mm. um, which I'm still in the pursuit of. 
But I do feel like this is a a next stage. And I feel that musically, I feel that artistically, I feel that um, with the way that this record is getting, uh, that it's resonating with people, I'm getting a, a reaction or just like, um, that I've never gotten before. So I, I do think that it's, it's a part of, well, what do I leave behind, you know, thinking about all the people that come and that have come and gone in my life and how I miss a lot of them and how do I miss people and miss moments while still exploring and being brave and um, and really diving into the art and believing that there's more beauty to be had or just believing in like the mystery of life time flies when you get I was born with a baby boy soul maybe someday I'm speaking with Alinda Segura of Hooray for the Riff Raff about their new album, The Past is Still Alive. And as we wrapped up our conversation, I asked for something I'm going to ask at the end of every conversation on a deeper listen, a music recommendation. KEXP is all about music discovery, and we find that artists light up when you ask them about music that they love. And so we thought that we'd share that love and help you discover new music too. Here's what Alinda Segura had to say. Well, I got obsessed with the la- uh, the latest Youth Lagoon record, Heaven is a Junkyard. I felt like there were so many themes in that record that just I needed to hear while I was recording this one. So I'm going to say Idaho Alien is a song that everybody should hear. And why that one specifically? I just really... First off, I very much relate to the idea of being an alien, <laughs> of being like, where did I come from? Like, you could call me a Bronx alien of just like, whoa, I just got dropped off the spaceship here and I don't know, like, I need to find my way home type of feeling. Um, and, and not even because you don't relate to the landscape, more so that you're just like, you know you have a mission or you know you have a people that you have to find and you're just kind of on this journey of how do I find it I I really relate to that and I also relate to the spiritual aspects of of the entire album And that was A Deeper Listen. Next time on the podcast, we'll hear from the New York via Bogota, Colombia duo Salt Cathedral about the themes on their new album, including screen addiction, climate change, and if we should bring more children into this world. It was kind of like this conscious, like, what are we doing? We we need to do better for our future children. And that's where Terminal Woes came from. That's coming up next time on A Deeper Listen. Well, what do you think of the episode? Let us know. Write a review in your podcast app. We're trying to spread the word about A Deeper Listen, and you can help by subscribing to this podcast, rating it, reviewing it, or sharing an episode with a friend or the people who follow you. 
You can also get in touch with me at deeper at kexp.org. And you can help support the show financially by giving a monthly donation at kexp.org slash deeper. Just $6 a month really goes a long way. I'm Emily Fox, and thanks for taking a deeper listen. Listen.